If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to take them and turn to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. I was spending some time this week at the Lanier Library studying. Great place to study. I get over there uh, as often as I can, especially now since uh, they are building our resident houses on uh, their campus. For those of you that are not familiar with the Lanier Library, it was founded by church member uh, Mark Lanier. Uh, he and Becky back in 2010 decided uh, to uh, build a library that could be opened up to the public, and it's a wonderful place, 100,000 uh, volumes that people have access to. I'm told it's the world's largest personal uh, theological library. It's very serene. If you've never made it over there, I would encourage you, if you're ever looking for a quiet place to study, uh, to just pray and be with the Lord, go over there. It is a gem uh, in our community, and uh, they host lectures nearly every month or so, and they bring in world-class scholars and theologians to uh, just address uh, certain topics that they are experts in. Uh, this month, they have an all-Spanish lecturer coming, again, just to, to be a blessing uh, to uh, our community. Now, when we were forming the residency program, uh, currently we have 23 residents. When we were talking about uh, the vision of this residency program, you as a church bought into it. And so 23 residents now serve on our team and they are uh, getting their uh, education at the seminary of their choosing. Uh, that's part of the policy of being a resident. You have to be within 10 years of your high school graduation, and you have to be working on your seminary, your master's in Bible, uh, and uh, you get your practical experience serving here in our church. And we've got residents that serve on all of our campuses. Yeah, they serve in their passion area of ministry, and so it could be student ministry, it could be worship ministry, it could be missions ministry. They're serving all over our church, children's ministry. And one of the first questions that we had when we began this residency program was where are they going to live? And many of you opened up your home and allowed these residents uh, who had graduated college to live in your house. And I want to thank you so much for doing that. I hope that it was a good experience uh, for you. Uh, but we, uh, at beginning this, uh, Mark and the foundation came to us and said, what, what if uh, we build housing on our campus uh, for your residents. They can live there in community with one another and they can do their schooling at the library, study, write their papers there and then work for you and in the church. And we said, that would be a wonderful idea. And so uh, we broke ground last year and I, I brought some pictures just to show you some updates of what's going on at the campus. I want you to see it and rejoice in it. This is one of the residents housing that a couple of the residents will live in and uh, you'll see that there's a bunch of buildings going up uh, right here, I think we've got an aerial shot of it being coming up right there, and uh, you'll see on this back row, uh, there's going to be uh, houses, cottages all around there. It's going to be a little village. Uh, they've actually put in a uh, little community house, a non-alcoholic pub, if you will, so these residents uh, can get together after uh, these uh, lectures and they can talk and debate theology and they can complain about their bosses here at the church and they can just live in community together. It's going to be great. He's also building a learning center here that uh, is just beautiful. Uh, if you haven't been over there, it's going to kind of be an exact replica of Christ Church in Oxford. It's just beautiful. Be able to sit three to four hundred and, and dine there. We're so grateful for the partnership uh, that we have with the Lanier Library and Foundation. On just a few, a couple of things about the resident housing. Number one is you can't register to live in this housing, okay? Uh, it's gonna be fabulous, but it's only for the residents. Secondly, uh, this really is going to set our residency program apart from any other residency program in the country. I, I, uh, I did my doctoral dissertation on uh, uh, a, developing a strategic intern program, and I looked all over the country at different internships and ministry programs like this, and there's not another one in the country uh, truly, that is doing what we're doing and have access uh, to the theology and to living together like this. It truly is going to set it apart. And then third, and this is a setup for where we're going with the message today. I was looking at all of that construction over there this week and just studying for the message this week. And I thought, you know what? It's so exciting to see all of this. What if we just went uh, to the Lanier Foundation Library and said, you know what? We know that you're continuing to build. We, we see the structures, but we just want to move in right now. Like, we're so excited. Just let us move in our, you can work around us and we'll live around you, but we want to move in right now as is 
and you just keep doing what you're doing. Sound crazy, right? Be foolish. They look at us and say, you can't do that. Uh, You can't move in until it's finished. You can't move forward. You can't do what you want to do until the project has come to completion. Today's message is all about a project coming to completion. As we continue in this Words in Red series, if you're taking notes, I encourage you to. The title of the message today is A Word of Completion. We're looking at seven statements that Jesus makes as he hangs on the cross. We know that the first three statements uh, happen sometime between nine o'clock in the morning when he hangs on the cross to 12 o'clock. He makes three statements. They all have to do with others. We'll review it here in just a moment. The next four statements happen Uh, After it turns dark, the Bible tells us at noon it turns to pitch black. Luke's gospel says that the sun's light failed. And most scholars believe that the last four statements that we have of Jesus on the cross were made in rapid succession near the very end of his physical life. Now by way of review, we looked at these in order. The first statement was a word of forgiveness. Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And he repeated it over and over again. The second word was a word of salvation where he looked at the thief that he was hanging next to on the cross who said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. Third word was a word of comfort that he spoke to his mother and to the apostle John. And in his dying breath, he was taking care of his mom and introducing this whole idea of the importance of a spiritual family and he spoke a word of comfort to his earthly mother and to the disciple whom he loved. And then we looked at this word of anguish where Jesus on the cross cries out. Here up to this point in his life he's only known his father's affirmation. This is my son whom I love and I'm well pleased listen to him. And here on the cross he doesn't address him as father as he had every other time. He addresses him my God, my God why have you forsaken me. Then there's this word of agony we looked at last week, where the parched lips of Jesus, perhaps not even having a drink since he partook of the Lord's Supper, 18 hours maybe on the cross without a drink, and he screams out, I thirst. And then the sixth statement today, a word of completion. It's found in John chapter 19, starting in verse 30. The Bible says, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Three words in our English text, it is finished. One word in the Greek, to telestai. We'll say more about this word in just a moment, but it is a word of completion. It's an accounting term of sorts that was used to be made, to mean paid in full. We sometimes sing the hymn when we receive the Lord's Supper, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the grave. Jesus paid it all. This is a cry of victory. And it is a cry. Jesus, in a sense, screams out, mission accomplished. And he screams out, John's Gospel notes this. Uh, Matthew's gospel notes it. Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. It's a guttural scream like the roar of a lion. Mark chapter 15, verse 37. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. It's a word of completion. A cry of victory. It is finished. And I want to build the message today off of what the word it means. When Jesus said, it is finished, what was he referring to? Well, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. We could say that Jesus means his suffering is finished. For Jesus, to this point, he has taken in the full wrath of God. He prayed in the garden, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. And that cup was filled 
with the wrath of God and Jesus has not let one drop spill out. He's taken it all in. And part of his suffering is drinking in the wrath of God. But Jesus didn't just suffer on the cross. He suffered his entire life from birth to death. His was a life of suffering. Pastor and commentator Philip Ryken said, from beginning to end, Jesus Christ lived a life of suffering from the moment he left the heavenly palaces of light to the moment darkness descended upon him on the cross, he suffered. It's why he was referred to prophet Isaiah as a man of sorrows. It's true, you think about his life. It was all about suffering. He was born in an insufferable place, a cave where animals were kept. John's gospel says that from the very beginning, John chapter one, verse 11, that he came to his own and his own received him not. He knew rejection. Isaiah chapter 53, verse three, he was despised and rejected by men. Here's where we get the term, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. His family thought he was crazy, for the most part, rejected him. He says of himself, Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, that the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Religious leaders were after him. In the garden, the disciples abandoned him. One of his disciples betrayed him. We've seen the people hurl insults, mock him spit upon him, soldiers crucify him. And then on the cross, he's forsaken by God, his father from start to finish. Jesus's life was one of suffering. And so when he cried out that day, it is finished. We could say that he was saying suffering is finished because he will never suffer again. His first coming, he came as a suffering servant. At his second coming, which we believe when we start our doctrine series the week after Easter, one of the, the, one, one of the doctrines that we believe, that we stake our life on, that we will not change on, that there is a line in the sand, is we believe in a literal, physical return of Christ. And when he comes for a second time, He's not coming as a suffering servant. He is coming as a reigning and ruling king. His suffering is over. It is finished. Now we've talked about the why behind his suffering. He was, of course, Philippians chapter two, emptying himself. He was identifying with man. Hebrews chapter four, he is our high priest. He understands our pain. He fully identifies with us, experiences our temptations, can fully sympathize with us. Our sin is behind his suffering. That's why it's interesting. Sin has to be atoned for. It has to be accounted for. And Jesus uses this word to telestai, this accounting term. In the death of Jesus, he is saying it is finished. He is announcing that sin is paid for in full. So his suffering, he could mean it is finished. Suffering is finished. It could mean that sacrifices are finished. When I went to college, my parents told me, said, Jarrett, here's what we're going to do for you. Uh, we're going to put $50 in your bank account every two weeks. I thought, that is awesome. <laughs> Every two weeks, it's just gonna magically be there. And then they gave me an Exxon gas card. And they said, you can put your gas on this gas card and every two weeks, you go to the ATM, you can get $50 out. You would not believe how far $50 will go at Taco Bell over the course of two weeks. You can spread it out, all right? A couple of double-deckers, a bean burrito, man, I'm telling you, you can eat for days uh, with $50. Uh, but what I found out with that Exxon gift card, uh, Exxon gas card, is that you could also go into Exxon <laughs> and purchase groceries with it. And so I would go in there and, uh, man, I'd get my Mountain Dew and my Reese's peanut butter cups and my Cool Ranch, whatever else. I went grocery shopping on that Exxon 
gift card. It was amazing because they would just, our gas card, because they would just take that credit card and they would just swipe it and I get to walk out with my groceries and a full tank of gas. Absolutely amazing because I never got a bill. But somebody, thank you mom and dad who watch every week, somebody foot that bill. It was mom and dad. Making sacrifices in the Old Testament was like swiping a credit card. People would bring their sacrifices and they would do it on a regular basis and those priests would put the blood of the sacrifice on that altar and people's sins would be atoned for and they would just swipe the card. But at some point, that bill had to be paid. And Jesus, when he comes and he dies on a cross for our sins, he is in effect footing the bill. He is paying for all of those sacrifices from the Old Testament and all of our sins that were in the future. He's paid for every single one of them when he died on a cross for our sins. Paid in full. Foot the bill. That's what Jesus did. Listen to the writer of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse three and four, but in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, verse 11 through 14. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices. Why? Because people continue to sin and these sacrifices can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice, his life, his body on that tree, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet, for by a single offering he is perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. A single offering. When John the Baptist saw Jesus that day he was being baptized, John chapter one, verse 29, he said, there is the Lamb of God who does what no other sacrifices could do. This Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. We'll talk more about this next week when Jesus yields up his spirit. He says, into your hands I commit my spirit. And the Bible says that the veil of the temple is torn in two, from top to bottom. And yes, that represented we have access to God, but the exclamation point of having access to God is what gets us that access. It's not the blood of bulls and goats anymore. It's the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus. So when Jesus says, it is finished, he could say, suffering, my suffering is finished. Sacrifices, once and for all, the single offering is finally made. Sacrifices are finished. He could have said, could have meant, Satan is finished. In the death of Jesus, Satan's defeated. Again, this is a cry of victory. And it's a fulfillment of scripture, the first promise of victory that we're ever given. When Adam and Eve choose to sin against God and they're led into that temptation by Satan who has manifested himself as a serpent, there is a curse put on the serpent. Genesis 3, 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. I Meaning there's gonna be a human that's gonna do what? He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And that prophecy, you have the bruising of the hill, Jesus, being put on a cross. But you have the bruising of the head, a crushing blow to the enemy where Jesus is securing eternal victory. It is finished. It's a cry of victory. He is triumphing in the cross. I mean, if we would have been there that day, seen the physical suffering of Jesus, certainly seen his distress, heard his cries, we would have looked at that and victory would have been the furthest thing from our minds. But Paul looks at the cross, sees Jesus on it. And listen to what he writes in Colossians chapter two, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. 
The reality of the cross is that Jesus, in living his perfect life and being obedient to death, he disarms Satan, triumphed over him, and in crying out, it is finished, he fulfills one of the main reasons that he came to earth. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, the second part. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And what is the greatest work the devil does? Is it not death? This is why 1 Corinthians chapter 15 calls death the final enemy, the great enemy. But Jesus, having tasted death for us, we no longer have to fear the enemy, his schemes, nor the greatest tool in his arsenal for causing fear, and that is death. We no longer have to fear it. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death are subject to lifelong slavery. The cross is the single greatest trophy of triumph that a Christian has. You know what I'm talking about when I say crosses, don't you? I brought a couple of these. We all get crosses when we were, now I ain't talking about participation trophies, all right? I'm talking about trophies you win. Trophies you get for putting in the work, paying the price. I have two trophies here. This is from pre t camp, 1989. 1990, back to back, <laughs> Star Camper Awards, preteen camp, 11 and 12 years old. Did I tell you it was back to back, preteen camper of the year, right here, Star Camper? <laughs> now, hold your applause. I know, hold your applause. <laughs> um, now, I got these trophies uh, because at preteen camp, you had to uh, memorize a number of verses. You got it for serving in different capacities. Uh, and I got these trophies, and I'm pretty proud of these trophies, all right? Um, it's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? Uh, being, being proud of a preteen camp trophy. And so uh, I keep these up in my office, not on my desk where everybody can see them, but in my bookshelf where everybody can see them, all right? And so <laughs> proud of these trophies. You get trophies for accomplishments. They're awards. You know, there's a reason that we put a cross on the top of our steeple, church tower out there. There's a reason. We don't just decorate our homes with crosses because it's good for decorations. There's something deeper than that. We don't just wear crosses around our neck because it's jewelry and it looks nice. No, the cross is a trophy of the greatest victory that Jesus has ever won. He defeated Satan, hell, and the grave once and for all. It's a trophy. And so when Jesus says it is finished, his suffering is finished. Um, Sacrifices are finished. Satan is finished. And we could say salvation is finished. We talk about the finished work of Jesus on the cross. It is finished. What is the finished work of Jesus? What do we mean when we say that? Jesus oftentimes would say, I've come to do my Father's will. I've got work that God the Father has given me to do. Let me give you some examples. John chapter four, verse 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. John 6, 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Luke chapter 12, verse 50, I have a baptism to be baptized with and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. The work of God was to accomplish the will of God. And the will of God was that Jesus would come to earth and willingly give up his life so that sin could be atoned for. And when Jesus says, it is finished, What he's saying is, God, 
Father, the work you have called me to do is complete. It is finished. I did what you sent me to do, and then he dies. And you know what he does when he dies? They take his body off that cross and he goes to a grave and rests. He accomplishes the work he was sent to do and then he rests. You heard that language anywhere before in your Bibles? John, I don't have time to look deep into this, but much of what he writes in his gospel echoes Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one, verse one, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. John chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God, the word was God. In Genesis chapter one, we read about light and darkness. You read John chapter one, Jesus, the true light, has come to this dark world. In Genesis chapter one, there are seven days of creation. He works six days and he rests on the seventh. In John's gospel, there are seven signs, seven major miracles that point to a new creation. In Genesis chapter one, God rests on the seventh day. In John's gospel, Jesus is resting in the grave after his seventh sign, Jesus dying on the cross. The words are closely aligned. You can't miss this. It's not a coincidence. Listen to Genesis chapter one, verse 30 through Genesis chapter two. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. He completed his work on the sixth day. When was Jesus dying on the cross, completing the work of salvation the sixth day? And what does God do after he creates the earth? Thus the heavens and the earth were what? Finished. Finished. And all the host of them on that seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. And Jesus right here in John 19, after 33 years on earth, three years of intense ministry, You read verses 28 and 29 of John chapter 19 that we looked at in detail last week. If you look at it in your Bibles, what does it say? Jesus, knowing that it was finished, fulfilled the last prophetic scripture, taking of the sour wine. It's a play on words, knowing it was finished. He says, it is finished. What is he saying? The work of recreation, the work of redemption is done. Mission accomplished. And while recreation won't be consummated until a future date that is set by the Lord himself, it's going to happen, it's as sure as happen as you and me being in this room today. It's beautiful, isn't it? It is finished. His suffering is finished, and to be clear, our suffering isn't finished. We still live in a fallen world. We're going to suffer, but because he suffered, we have one that is always with us in our suffering. He can identify with us. Sacrifices are finished. He is the full and final sacrifice. Satan is finished. Doesn't mean sin is finished. We still battle. But the Bible says, Ephesians chapter six, our battle is not against flesh and blood. There's still a spiritual war that's going on, but Satan who tempts us to evil and leads us to sin while he is roaming this earth, First Peter says, like a roaring lion, he is roaring, but his teeth have been knocked out at the cross. He has no bite, all right? Jesus, you know, in, in the word, his, God the Father, his sins say, said, finish him, all right? Karate Kid reference for all my 80s friends, okay? And Jesus finished him. Salvation is finished to telestai. Now again, this word has such a wide range of meaning. It can be used as an accounting term. It means to to reach a goal, to, to accomplish, to bring to an end of something, to finalize, to perfect. That's exactly what Jesus did in living his life and dying on the cross. He brings to completion a life of obedience and faithfulness to God. He accomplishes our salvation in finishing his race perfectly. He promises that he will perfect us 
along the way. And we will never be able until we die or he comes, we will never be able to say we are finished. We are a work in progress. Um, He finished his work on the cross, but he's not finished with us. I was reminded just in studying this week, uh, Ruth Bell Graham, the wife of Billy Graham, when she passed away in 2007, before she passed away, she had seen a construction sign while she was driving, and she, she saw this construction sign that said, under construction, thank you for your patience, and she saw that, she said, I want that on my epitaph, so when she died in 2007, that's what they put on her epitaph, right there, the very bottom, if you can't read it, it says, end of construction, thank you for your patience. Jesus, the one who perfectly completed his race, has promised to perfect us. But how does he do that? Let me give you some closing application as we bring this message to an end here because I always want you to have application. I want want you to, what we talk about on Sundays ought to be helping us Monday through Saturdays to live a life pleasing to the Lord, helping us grow in our relationship with the Lord. Let me give you three points of application uh, from this message right here. Number one is rest in the finished work of Christ. This is for sure application number one. There are some of you here today listening to me online and you are working like crazy to live a life that is pleasing to God to somehow earn his favor somehow earn your salvation, thinking that if your good in life just outweighs the bad, and it's as if there's this cosmic scale that when you die, if the good will outweigh the bad, then you get to go be in the presence of God forever and ever. You get to go to heaven, and it couldn't be any further from the truth. Because Jesus finished the work of salvation on the cross. Anything we add to it actually takes away from it. We can't add anything to it. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And so the application is we need to rest in the finished work of Christ. For some of us, we are on this spiritual treadmill trying to please God, thinking have I done enough, will I ever do enough, and it is exhausting. And God, by the power of his Holy Spirit today, is saying get off the treadmill and you just come to me by faith, rest in what I've done done. Your Christianity is not do do. It is done in Christ. D-O-N-E. It's what he has done and we rest in that until he comes. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me all you who are tired, who have heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. There's a reason the gospel is called good news because he gives us soul rest that only he can give and he only gives when we throw up our hands and say, I don't bring anything to the table and we rest in his finished work. Secondly, reflect often on the finished work of Christ. You wanna know how to grow as a Christian? It's not on a to-do list. I gotta go to church, gotta have my quiet time, I gotta give, I gotta serve, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. I can line up person after person that can check off this list, but don't a bit more love Jesus passionately than a man on the moon. The the Pharisees checked off the list and Jesus had his most harsh words for that religious crowd. You want want to grow in your affection for Christ? You wanna grow in your relationship with Christ? It begins by thinking often and pondering on the finished work of Christ and as you do that it will enlarge your heart it will increase your passion and this checklist that you're keeping it'll take care of itself you won't even have to think about it because the more you think and ponder on the finished work of Christ on your behalf I'm telling you that's fuel for spiritual growth I mean this is the homework this week when you have your time alone with the Lord however long you spend just take an additional minute, two minutes, and just reflect on what the finished work of Christ means for you. And just test me in this. Watch your heart begin to grow and your, 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 your adoration and worship for God begin to grow as you do it. I mean, let's just do it. We got, we got some time, all right? Not too much, but we got some time. Let's just do it right here. Let's just think together. 
on the finished work of Christ and what it does for us. I'll just, I'll just say some things just thinking about it. Finished work of Christ. It shows that I have value because Jesus died for me. Therefore, my identity is not in what you think of me, what I can do for somebody. I have, I have value because of who I am in Christ. His finished work on the cross shows me that. I have a family. I'm never alone. Finished work of Christ shows me. He puts me in a spiritual family called the church. I may feel alone, but the reality is I am not alone. I don't have to walk around with a guilty conscience. Finished work of Christ took care of all of my sin, past, present, and future, because all my sin was in the future when Jesus died for me. Romans 8, 1, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The finished work of Christ, I can stand before God and man with a clean heart. I can go to bed. I can pillow my head tonight in peace. I mean, you think long and hard on the finished work of Christ. You reflect on the finished work of Christ. And as you begin to do that, my goodness, you'll say, who can I share Jesus with? I, I, gotta, I gotta get alone so I can worship him. I, I wanna show somebody else his love. I wanna serve in this way. Reflecting and pondering on the finished work of of Christ. And then third and finally, resist ten, sin and temptation from the finished work of Christ. Resist sin and temptation from the finished work of Christ. What do I mean by this? Jesus secured our victory dying on the cross. He crushed the head of Satan. The war has been won. But there is a spiritual battle every single day. The enemy's tempting us, luring us away from God, how do we fight this battle? Well, when I say resist sin and temptation from the finished work of Christ, what I'm saying is when you face spiritual battles, you're not so much fighting for victory as you're fighting from a place of victory. Because in the finished work of Christ, what does it do for you? It shows you that Jesus died, and when we trust in his death and his burial and his resurrection, the Spirit of God lives in us. Therefore, according to 1 John 4, 4, he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. And so there is not a sin that can have a consistent, habitual victory over me because the Holy Spirit is in me. There's not a stronghold that I have to be addicted to, that I can't kick if the Spirit of God is living in me. This is what the finished work of Christ does for me. When I come and I think about the finished work of Christ and resisting sin and temptation from the finished work of Christ, I am realizing that I, when I come to the cross, I have died. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. I have his Spirit empowering me to say no to sin, no to the enemy, and yes to the Holy Spirit of God. Our job is to simply abide, submit, surrender, and the victory is ours. March Madness, two more teams in it tonight. Got any UT fans out there? You're the only ones with your bracket still intact, all right? Good luck. It's been madness this year. I was thinking about March Madness, watching these games last night, thinking about this sermon. It is finished, because here's the deal. At the end of the day, it's not how you start. It's how you finish. I was thinking about Jesus on that cross. In the terms of March Madness, man, he looked like a 15 seed, no name, no conference. He looked like he was whipped, done. But it's not how you start. It's how you finish. And Jesus beat the number one seed called death on the cross. He beat Satan and sin. And he cries out in victory a word of completion. It is what? Finished. Let's pray together. Thank you for joining us online. We hope today's experience encouraged and challenged you. At Champion Forest, we are passionate about all kinds of people coming to know God, to grow in their relationship with Him and others, and then to go out and make a difference in the world. We would love the opportunity to talk and pray with you. 
To connect with us, just go to championforce.org slash connect. And hey, of course, we can't wait to welcome you on campus in person on one of our locations. We'll see you soon.